But one thing I want to stress about protein that people who are on a plant-based diet don't understand is they think, oh, if I eat a bunch of salad, protein's not an issue. It is an issue. It's a big issue. And most plant-based people don't have enough protein in their diet. We need to structure our meals like meat eaters structure their meals. We need to be having a lot of protein because we're losing 33 grams right off the bat just from the dying cells in our body. Plus, most people don't know this, but protein is what your immune system is made of. So if you want to have a good, strong immune system, you need proteins because that's what keeps you from getting sick. If you're getting sick all the time, maybe you need to eat more protein because that is what is helping build those amino acids and those enzymes to keep you from getting sick. So today, we're going to talk about how much food does it actually take to feed a family. Now, some of the calculations we're going to show are based on just two people, just a couple, but you can then adjust that and rework that for however many people it is in your family. So we're showing here some of the things that we've grown here at AD. Last year, on the, the bottom right picture, we have some watermelon, some cantaloupe, we have a bunch of eggplant and zucchinis, and some Swiss chard and beans in the back. And uh, then you see some of the lettuce that we've been growing, and even a block of wheat that is growing this year. All right. Maybe before we get into further um, discussion about this topic, it would be a good question to ask, we posted here, what do you like to eat? And that's a very broad question because sometimes we like to eat things that can't grow in our garden or that might not even be that healthy for us. So the question here that we brought up is really here to help us understand how we need to plan for our garden for the coming season. And what that means is when you plant stuff and then no one in the family, including yourselves, likes to eat it, then you kind of planted it for no good reason, right? So that question can be really helpful in planning your garden and figuring out, okay, what are the things that we like to eat that can grow in our garden and that we use a lot? Those things we need to grow a lot. So let's say if we like to eat a lot of potatoes and we don't grow any, well, that's going to be a problem. So if we like lots of potatoes, let's plant lots. If no one in the family likes artichokes or eggplant, well, then we might not really want to bother even taking time to try to grow them, right? So that's one of the basic questions that I think is really important to settle. What things do we like to eat? What things do we use a lot? that can grow in our garden, and then we can move on with all the other things we need to plan to set up our plan for growing our garden. Another thing that is really important to remember is that where is your garden, you know? And I'm not talking if it's behind or in front of your house, I'm talking more like the geographic location. Are you living close to the equator? Do you live in Alaska? Do you live in southern BC or in central BC? Even those can make a big difference. It will give you a different growing season. You will work with a different climate. You might get more sunshine than other places. So it's really important to know what, what area you're in. And that will also determine what crops you can grow. Because if you live right where we are here, you are not going to be able to grow pineapples. But you will be able to grow potatoes. And if you are somewhere down south, there might be some of the crops that we grow here that wouldn't do as well because it's so hot for so long. So you kind of want to look at that location and say, okay, these things can grow well here. We use them a lot. Let's grow a lot of them. Another thing that really is important too is your 
soil conditions, and sometimes there's microclimates that can really change the picture. So sometimes along big rivers, the climate is a lot different than the rest of the area, and it might allow you to grow things that you may not be able to grow even 20 kilometers away from that river. And something that's a very clear um, cut for most of the growing is when your last frost is. When you have a hard frost, a lot of your crops might not make it. So if you plant them too early, it might be nice for a week or two, you plant it all, and then this weekend comes where it's just cold and rainy, and then there's a hard frost, it might kill your crop. So it's very important to know your first frost in the fall, but also the, the last frost in the spring is really crucial, so you don't plant too early, otherwise you might lose all the plants you started. So having those frost dates really decides it kind of puts that frame on the season that you have to grow in. Um, can and you can look that up online. Yes. You can get a farmer's almanac. You can get all these things to find out exactly what your zoning is. Right. Your zoning charts, they're not always super accurate because especially when you're talking about elevation like we are here, right. just from this spot going to Horsefly, which is only about half an hour away, it's quite a vast difference or going down to the city is, is not that far in Williams Lake and you'll see a, quite a bit of a difference in the climate there. They get a lot less snow, it warms up much faster in the spring and in the summer when it's still bearable up here you can still work outside, down there is already way too hot so that can make a difference as well. Okay, when we talk about what equipment you have it's not only your tractors or your tools. There's a lot of other things that can really help you grow more and longer. Um, one of them would be a greenhouse. And depending on the insulation value, on how many layers of plastic you use, if you have heat in there and where it's located, you can really extend your season quite a bit. And in certain areas, if you have some heat in there, that you can turn on when it gets too cold, you might even be able to get an extra month or two just like that in your growing season, which can really help. Um, the other thing is do you have access to water? If you grow quite a bit of food, you will need water when it gets hot in the summer, otherwise you might lose your crops or you might not have as much harvest or not good quality of harvest. So water access is important and then how do you apply the water? Do you have equipment to do that or do you have to go with your garden hose? I can tell you from experience, going with your garden hose is a full-time job or two. And so having some equipment that helps you apply the water in your fields can really save you time and can up your crop quite a bit. Like, you'll harvest a lot more. And then there's small machines if you just start out smaller and you have like half an acre or an acre. Um, little walk-behind tractors, rotor tillers like you see on the top there, those can really be helpful. They're like a workhorse that you just walk behind and you can get lots done in your garden without owning a big tractor. Now if you go bigger and while you can, it's, it's great to have a tractor, but it might not be necessary depending on the size of, of field that you're planting. I'm um, talking about the greenhouse a little bit more. So we at ED right now, we have two greenhouses. We have our big greenhouse, which is not heated. It's only heated just from the sun. Right. And then we have a smaller one that we actually had a wood stove in, and we are heating since, what month did we start the greenhouse? Um, middle of March. Middle of March. Yeah, we had quite so a then we were winter. able to start a lot of our seedlings in the middle of March, and me and Timon were trading off stoking yeah. the, the stove at night so that it would stay warm, yeah. and uh, we were able to start a lot of things earlier. So that right. helps a lot, especially if you have a shorter season, and uh, that was a, a big help to us. That's right. Okay, we kind of touched that a little bit, but maybe to go a little bit deeper into that part of the growing, if you grow stuff in your garden that might grow for part of the season, but it can't mature because the season is too short, it's also a bit of a waste of time. So it's really important to, to determine what likes to grow in your area. You know, that's a good good point, but how do you figure that out? And there's a few things that you can do to figure that out. One is when you buy your seed, usually seed companies will have a seed catalog and they'll tell you a lot of things about the varieties. 
They'll tell you what climate they prefer, if they grow better in the spring, in the fall, or mainly in the summer. They will tell you if those varieties take longer to mature. Sometimes good seed companies will actually tell you how many days it takes from when the plant germinates until you can harvest. So they'll say 68 days to maturity or to harvest or 110 days. And so as you choose your seeds, it's very important that you find out, will this actually mature in my area? If I plant it the first day that I can plant, will I be able to get to a harvest with that or is it going to get cold before that matures? And there's different varieties. Some crops, you take a cabbage. Some cabbage will grow for you in 65 to 70 days. And if you are up here where we are, you can probably get two or three seedings behind each other and they'll all mature pretty good. But then there's cabbage that'll take 120 days. And this year, depending on when our first frost will come, we may only have 110 days of growing season. So if we plant that cabbage here and we know it takes 120 days to mature, but we'll only have 110 days to actually grow, there's a pretty low chance of us getting good crop on that. So it's really important to look at that when you buy your seed, so you buy varieties that will for sure make it. And I would say it's better to give it a little bit extra. So if you know you have 110 days of growing season, maybe buy a variety that will grow in 100 days or 90 days, so you have a little bit of slack on each end there. Now, this frost date is not always an exact date, but it's within a range that's pretty consistent overall. And then also, some of those things, even if they don't grow on the certain days, you could start them early right. and get a little bit of a head start. Right. Especially things like tomatoes, cabbage, that take egg a little plant, bit longer. Peppers, yeah. Uh, yeah, eggplant, peppers, uh, even sometimes. Now, we're, we're going to find out this year yeah. if our corn <laughs> makes it. We did some early, and then we did a big patch that was actually direct seeded, and it seems like it might make it. Yeah, we um, have small cobs on it, so it's, it's going the right direction, but we'll see if it's got enough time to make it before it freezes here. So, yeah, that's kind of the varieties can be a big part. Now, it also depends on what soil you have and what overall climate you have. So some things might not grow there at all, or they might just grow leaves but never bring fruit. So you want to kind of look through that as well. And then also, like we said earlier, if you have a greenhouse, that can really extend your season and that might allow you to grow things that wouldn't grow outside at all here, right? So like we said, eggplant outside, if you seed them outside, there's pretty guaranteed no fruit on that plant up here. But we started them three months early in the greenhouse and transplanted them and potted them up and fed them and everything. And when we planted them outside, they had already little fruit and now they're growing the fruit really nice, right? So then the next question is, what facility do you have to store this food? That's a really important question. Do you have a root cellar? Do you have a cold room? Do you even know what a root cellar is or a cold room is? Um, do you have fridges or freezers or anything like this? Um, now, there's a quote from Ellen White that says, uh, it's in Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 470, and it says, do not make a time of trouble before it's here. So you don't have to make things harder on yourself. Well, we have electricity and all these conveniences. You can use a rototiller, you can use a tractor, you can use the things that you have, uh, freezers and all this. Now, if you have solar, then it's not such a big problem. Right. But uh, getting a root cellar or a cold room is going to be extremely important and is very important, especially for storing things like squash or potatoes or these things that take a cool temperature. Most of your root crops really. All yeah. your root crops, yeah, your carrots, mm -hmm. beets, all these things. So here we have a picture of a root cellar. It's an old root cellar and you can see they have some big pumpkins on the ground in the back there and then they have all this nice canned food that was grown in the garden. Now a root cellar, all it is, is a building that's put underground because the soil temperature stays consistent all year round at plus six degrees Celsius. So once you get to whatever depth that is in your area, most times it's around six feet or eight feet deep from the surface. So you, that doesn't mean you need necessarily eight feet of dirt on the top of your root cellar, 
but as long as it's in the ground, this one's a little bit shallow for our area, especially because the frost would get right into there. So when you're talking about a root cellar, the frost depth in your area is really important because if the frost is going down three feet into the ground, you need to have three feet of soil on top of your root cellar. It's going to freeze inside your root cellar and it'll wreck all of your food. Or you can put some extra insulation or something on top of there and then you don't need quite as much, much soil. Right. But we're not going to get into those details today. We actually sell some really good books on root cellaring. Here's some shelves and things inside a root cellar. So you have all the nice canned food. You have your garlic and some onions and some squash on the shelves there. And the next question, I'll let Timon answer this, is yeah. how many people's in your family that you're trying to feed? Right, so it depends a little bit on how much food you will need based on how many people you have in your family or if you're just by yourself. Um, for me, we have two little boys and my wife and myself, so that makes four. But our two little boys are just starting, well, the older one is eating pretty good already, but the younger one is just starting to eat a little bit here and there. So depending on what the needs of the family are, you need to grow different things, right? So our boys like a lot of fresh little things. In the summer, they'll go to all the plants, they'll eat peas, they'll eat the little tomatoes, and they'll, if you pull a carrot and you wash it, they'll grab it and chew on it. So depending on your size of family, you need a certain amount of food. Now also, um, it depends if you have any pets that you wanna maybe try to feed them something too. And some of them will, will eat stuff that comes from the garden. Um, another thing that can also be helpful, and that's not on here right now, but if you're hoping to help some of your neighbors or you have some elderly neighbors that need help or that don't have the means to or the energy anymore to grow a big garden, well, maybe you want to plan in a little extra so that in the winter you could go and give them sometimes help them out a little bit, or even just to keep a nice connection with your neighbors, you go bring them a little bit of food here and there. So that can be a nice thing to calculate in as well. And then obviously, um, if there's any other people that could come visit you or you know of that you're like, oh man, when they come, I'll use up a month worth of food, right? So you kind of want to plan in for a little extra there. We want to think like Noah, that there's going to be a lot more guests coming on the ark all the animals that were coming in. He didn't plan only for his, his family of eight, but he planned for a lot of extra. Right. Now, I wanted to talk, and I'm going to try to keep this not too technical, but we need a certain amount of food in order to function properly, just to sustain our life. So we're not talking about eating lavishly so much that we're over full all the time but we need to make sure that we're reaching our, our basic requirements. So some of the things to think about. Now, there's a lot of different micronutrients. Those are all your vitamins and some of your fatty acids and different things like that. You don't have to be so concerned about that, especially when you're growing your own food. They're very rich in that, as long as you're getting a variety. But the things you want to keep in mind are your macronutrients. That's your carbohydrates, your proteins, your fats, and then a category of green and fresh. So you need that for your enzymes to keep your digestion flowing properly. So the main three, carbohydrates, protein, and fats, is the ones that you want to make sure that you're growing enough of so that you can function normally. Now, on average, the average BMR, and that is basal metabolic rate. And what does that mean? That means the amount of calories it takes for your body to function if it's just sitting. This isn't putting out a lot of exerted exercise. This is if you're sitting on the couch, just surviving. not doing much, <laughs> just surviving. Average is 1,200 to 1,800 calories. The brain itself uses a fifth of this. So if you are in a deficit of calories that's too low, your brain will actually start to suffer and not function properly because your body requires, your brain requires, and so something's got to give. Hmm. Protein, the average person, you can be good on 0.36 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And what's interesting, and most people don't know this, is you use 33 grams a day 
of protein just to survive, just of the protein that you're losing by all the dead cells leaving your body and the new ones growing. So just you, not, that's not talking about adding muscle or anything. This is just for your body to basic metabolism function. Then carbohydrates, 1.5 grams per pound, and then healthy fats up to 0.65 grams per pound of body weight per day. And this seems very technical, but it's not that complicated. I have an app on my phone, and you can use it on the computer as well, and it's called Chronometer. It's not a, we're not getting paid for that, but it's been a very helpful tool if you're trying to find out if you're reaching your daily requirements of your main food groups. So you go to chronometer.com, and you can put in what you're eating. Or you can put in any food if you're wondering what the nutrition is. And it has every single mineral and vitamin that's in that food for how much weight or how much of that food is. So now here's a real-life example. So let's say for breakfast you had some tofu, some oatmeal, almonds, flax seed. That's for your, your omega fatty acids. Uh, some honey and some strawberries. So for breakfast, you got in 45 grams of protein. Your carbs were 75 grams, and your fats were 27. Now, the requirements for a 180-pound male per day is 65 grams of protein, 270 grams of carbohydrates, and then 117 grams of fats. Now, these are round figures. These are going to fluctuate a little bit depending on the person, of course. Um, depending on the build structure, if the person is a lot heavier build or if they're a lighter build, these are going to fluctuate a little bit. But one thing I want to stress about protein that people who are on a plant-based diet don't understand is they think, oh, if I eat a bunch of salad, protein's not an issue. It is an issue. It's a big issue. And most plant-based people don't have enough protein in their diet. We need to structure our meals like meat eaters structure their meals. We need to be having a lot of protein because we're losing 33 grams right off the bat just from the dying cells in our body. Plus, most people don't know this, but protein is what your immune system is made of. So if you want to have a good, strong immune system, you need proteins because that's what keeps you from getting sick. If you're getting sick all the time, maybe you need to eat more protein because that is what is helping build those amino acids and those enzymes to keep you from getting sick. So then for lunch, let's say we have some potatoes, black beans, some lettuce, tomato, cucumber, and some sunflower oil for our dressing. And uh, I said sunflower oil because olive oil we can't grow here. Maybe where you are, you can <laughs> grow olive oil. Yeah. But uh, for us, it would be sunflower oil if you're trying to grow all your, your food. So there we got 20 grams of protein, carbs, 80 grams, and 15 grams of fats. And for dinner, maybe you had a little bit lighter. You had some popcorn, which you can grow. All right. You had some canned fruit, some toast, some peanut butter, some honey. And then the total that we got that day, protein, we were really good. We had 83 grams. Carbs, 237 grams, which is a little on the low side, which isn't the end of the world because these are some complex carbohydrates. And we got a little bit more protein, so that can make up for it. And our fats is right in a good range around 50 grams of fats, and the fats are up to 117 grams. So that doesn't mean you have to hit 117 grams of fat, but you should get some fat because your brain runs on fat, and we want our brain to be functioning properly. So, with our garden, we need to calculate for a minimum loss of at least 10%. Maybe right. some of our seeds won't germinate, maybe we're going to have some things get rot. Maybe the deer's going to come yeah. and it's going to eat our crops. Maybe the things that are stored are going to go bad, some of it. Right. So a 10% is, is definitely a minimum. At times, you might lose a little bit more, but it depends on the year, depends on what happens in your garden. So you definitely want to not calculate tight and say, oh, I planted 10 pepper plants and I'll have all the peppers I need. Plant a few more if you can. Okay, here's a couple staple foods that I like to grow in my garden. And I'm just gonna kind of walk you through that, explain a little bit what that looks like and what you can do with it. Now, like I said in the beginning, it all depends on what you and your family like to eat or 
what you can grow. It's kind of those two factors are your main factors. Now for me and my family, we like to grow lots of potatoes. They're easy to grow, they store well, and we use quite a few of them over the winter. Potatoes will grow in this area and they'll grow in most areas unless it's way too hot and sandy, then they will, might not turn out so well, but they're pretty easy to grow overall. I want to emphasize potatoes because potatoes <coughs> have a lot of good carbohydrates and they actually have a decent amount of calcium. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we need for strong bones and they are one of the simplest things that you can grow in your garden and the simplest things to keep and then save your, your seed or your potato uh, roots to grow the next year. Right. And potatoes will grow in very short seasoned areas as well. Like there's people way up north, even into Alaska, that can grow potatoes and their summer is not very long. So that's something that can be pretty standard for a lot of people. We also like to grow some carrots. We like to eat them fresh. We make juice with them. We make salads with them. Um, my wife uses them to cook, make soups, make different other things, stir fry, whatever. And carrots um, are really healthy and you can eat them raw, so you don't have to cook them. You can eat them raw. And if you store them well, they will last you for a long time, like most of the winter, basically. Um, another thing that we like to grow is cabbage. And it is preferred if you can start it a bit early inside the greenhouse to get a head start and that will help you to actually grow nice heads, at least in this area here. And cabbage can be used for a lot of things. As you can see here, you can make sauerkraut to store over the winter. You can make salads, soups, you can can it, you can use it fresh. So there's a lot of ways to use that. Um, one thing that I like to grow, and for those of you who were on our garden tour, you saw our onions growing up there in the field. I like to grow onions, and onions are not only good for making salad and for cooking, they're really good for natural remedies. So when you have insect bite you, or like a bee comes, or wasp comes, stings you, if you cut an onion in half and you put it on the skin as soon as you can, it really helps to stop that swelling and take all the poison out. So we always take an onion along even when we go camping or go on a trip. Take an onion or two along. If someone gets stung, you cut it, put it right on there and it can really help. Also in the winter when there's not much sun and it's cold and people start getting a little bit sick and stuff, get the cough, whatever. We like to cut up some onion, put it on a plate next to the bed and when our boys, when their nose is a bit runny or whatever, we just put it right by their bed overnight and that onion smell, they breathe it and it really opens up their whole system and it really helps them to get over it fast. So that being said, if you count onions just for what you cook on a daily basis, that's good. But you may need quite a bit more if you use it for natural remedies. So that's something to calculate in as well. Um, tomatoes. Um, at this point, we like tomatoes fresh, we can them, we make tomato sauce, so in the winter you just open the jar, put it on your food and you're ready to go. Um, something with tomatoes, you have to start them quite early and it's much better if you're in a colder climate to have a greenhouse to grow them. If you do outside, you'll get some fruit, but it's never the same as in a greenhouse, so that can be a, a good tip there. Something with... Um, Cucumbers, they're really nice and juicy, so in the summer when you eat them, they'll give you lots of water and they'll keep you hydrated as well. So cucumbers grow pretty well. The only thing that I've found is if it gets too cold when you first plant them outside, it can really be hard on them and potentially even kill them. So we like to grow cucumbers. One thing though is that beside pickling them, there's not really a good way to store them. Like even if you keep them in your fridge, they might last you a week or two and then they'll start going down already. So don't plant a whole lot unless you have types that you can can well and you can them because that's not something you want to store tons of in the winter. It's just more like eat it in the summer when it's there and then it's done. The only ones you'll want to store is for your seed. Right. So you'll take right. the, the nice biggest ones that are turning orange on the plant, leave them alone, don't pick them, and then have a couple plants or a couple uh, cucumbers Maybe just a handful of them. Yeah. 
keep them in your cold room, like we said, until after the Christmas, new year. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can take the seeds and, and save them for next year, and you'll have many more seeds than you could ever even use from three or four cucumbers. Oh, yeah. And one thing with the cucumber seeds that's very interesting, just a tip there, I've been taught and I've tried it and it really works. Cucumber seed takes time to mature. So the first year after you harvest it, if you plant it, it'll grow okay, but not all of them will germinate. The cucumber seed actually takes almost two years to really develop the best. So if you plant the seeds in the second year, you will get the best germination you can get on cucumber seeds. So that's just a little tip there for you. If you're growing your own cucumber seed, grow enough that you can keep some for two years from now, and those will be probably the best you can grow, given that you store them right. And that's kind of a little bit what we talked about yesterday. Another thing that we like to grow is string beans. We like them fresh, you know, use the green ones, cook them, make salad. You can can them, you can freeze them, and use them in the winter. They're really good for that. And um, you can also grow beans that might be nice when they're green, and if you don't harvest them all, you let them dry up, and then you can have dry beans. Now, I will say there's different varieties, and if you are aiming for dry beans, plant varieties that are good for that, so you actually get a lot of dry beans, and not just nice, lots of green <laughs> um, beans that don't have much bean inside it, I guess. Another thing that we really like to grow is different herbs. And, you know, you use some for cooking in the summer, maybe not a whole ton, but growing some of your herbs yourself can save you a lot of money, even if it's just for the summer. And it can really be nice when you have fresh parsley or fresh basil or any of these, just when you cut them, man, they smell so good. And one thing that's really nice about herbs, you can harvest them, dry them, and then they will store for a long time. Now, I'm not suggesting you should store them for 10 years because every year they'll lose some of their taste and their smell and their... their potency. Yes, their potency. But if you can store them and dry them up, they can be used in the winter in soups. You can use them to make herb salts and a lot of other things. So growing some of your herbs can really be a nice thing. And you can also make teas out of some of them. So for my family, we grow a lot of chamomile. We really like to grow that. Um, we also grow basil to make pesto. We grow chives. You can freeze dry that or just dry it. Um, chives are a really nice herb for the garden because you don't have to plant it every year. Right. And They'll it just keeps back. spreading yes. and getting bigger. And then you can just move it more and then you keep getting more and more chives. Yeah, similar with thyme and oregano, they'll come back too. Um, basil is probably one of the pickiest ones. You'll have to reseed that and it needs nice heat before you can put it out there. If it gets cold, it'll, it'll not be happy. Another thing that can be really nice to grow is horseradish. Um, it's not really something you eat like carrots, but you can use it in the winter for natural remedies. And um, you can also use it in different canning, like if you can tomatoes or can pickles, it's very nice to have it in there. And that will also grow back every year. You just take some roots out, leave some in there, and it'll just keep growing back. The last one that we have on the bottom of that line there is garlic, and it's also a very nice herb, if you want to say. So it's not really an herb, but it's kind of used at that amount in your kitchen. And it can also be really good for natural remedies. And you can also use it for your garden if you have pests sometimes and you need to make a garlic spray to get rid of some aphids or some other things. Garlic can really be helpful. It's natural, it grows in your garden, so you just use it when you need it. I don't think we can underestimate uh, or overestimate the importance of garlic because it is nice for flavoring, but it right. is super important for a natural remedy, especially yeah. when you can't get a lot of other different herbs. Yeah. It's very strong. Onions and garlic and these things. It's Even awesome, peppermint yeah. would be a great herb to add into here. Right. Um, and these this things. is just a quick little short list. This is definitely not everything you should grow. There's a lot more herbs that you can grow. Like rosemary is very nice to grow. Different types of mints. There's quite a few types of mints out there. Can really be nice to grow as well. Actually, in one of our series with Walt Cross, he was talking about growing, and he said, try just five or ten herbs in your garden. Pick the first ten, try and grow them. 
Don't try and do 50 all at the same year right. and overwhelm yourself. Pick a few, start doing them really well, and then add a couple next year, add a couple next year. Right. And then you can get your arsenal of your natural remedies built up. And then you also figure out, oh, I don't need much of that. If I have one plant, that's plenty of what I need per year. And then you see some others, man, we ran out before the snow even came. Let's grow a bunch more of that, right? So it'll help you to, to know how much you need as well. Another thing that we really like to grow is lettuce. And there is probably a decent bit of lettuce out in the field. For those of you who have been on the tour, there's a lot of lettuce right now that is coming on. Lettuce is also not something you can store really well, but it's really nice to have in the summer. It grows very fast, and just about any growing area will allow you to grow at least a few plantings staggered so that it always comes on fresh for you. And, you know, lettuce, you can harvest it early already, but if you don't harvest it right away, it'll grow for a while. Eventually, it'll start bolting, but you have a little bit of a harvest window, and it's really good for you to be able to get lots of fresh stuff in in the summer, and lettuce is one of the things. It grows fast. It's not a heavy feeder, and it covers the soil pretty fast, so if you weed it and it grows up, it'll, it'll take care of itself. Um, you can use it just to make salad, use it fresh. People like sometimes to put it in smoothies. You can put it in your sandwiches. Um, just take it along. Sometimes I just like to eat the leaves as they come. So that's something I like to grow a lot of, but just to say it's not something you can really store for the winter. Now there is some type of salads, and that's maybe going a little bit further. Those are um, bitter salads. They have very strong cells and they're pretty hard. And if you grow them toward the end of the summer into the fall, they can handle some frost and they will actually be similar to kale except you have to get them out before the real cold comes. And I know a guy back at home in Austria, he grows some of the bitter salads, which are radicchio and then what's the other one called? Um, it's a green one that's growing very upright, similar to romaine lettuce, but it's bitter. And some of those bitter salads, they will actually last if you store them cool and dry. Not too dry, so you don't dry them, but they don't need to be like wet, wet. Those will actually store, I know one guy, he stored them all the way to spring until the first dandelion plants came out. So he had salad all winter long. Now it was bitter, and I like bitter, some people don't like it. So if you soak it in a little bit of warm water before you cut it up, that can really help to get some of the bitterness out. But it's not unhealthy, so if you get used to the bitter flavor, you can even have some of that salad in the winter. Um, the last thing that I put on here for my top 10, I guess, is winter squash. Now there is summer squash, and that refers to some of your softer squash types, like zucchini or some of the other small ones that don't really get a hard shell or a hard um, skin. Winter squash, though, it takes a bit longer to mature. It's a heavy feeder, which means in turn that you're probably getting a decent bit of um, nutrition out of it. And winter squashes, there's quite a few different types. They grow a hard peel, and you actually want to cure them a bit before you store them when you harvest them. Um, and curing just means to have them fairly warm and dry, not necessarily in the sun, maybe a little bit, but if the sun is very hot, you might not want to be right in the direct sun. But as they harden up their skin, they will last quite a bit longer, and you can store squash quite a few months into the winter, maybe not all the way till spring, but you can get a couple months out of that. And squash can be similar to maybe potatoes. You can cook it. You can eat it raw too, but most of it is better when it's at least steamed make soups, and you can even freeze some in the fall or in the winter when you get to that point where the squash starts to go, oh, they're almost going bad, well, you could cut it up, see what's still good, and freeze that, and I'll extend it for you a bit. So squash is, is nutritious, very good to eat. You can make soups, and I like to grow it. We'll see how it grows up here. So far, it's growing well, but we're still waiting for some of the bigger fruit to mature, so it's going to be going to be a nice thing to see what, what happens here. Those are kind of the top 10 that I put up. There's lots of other things I like to grow, but if I, had, if I had those, that would be a pretty good start for me anyways. And this 
It doesn't have to be the same for everybody. Right. You will modify this, you will change this depending on what you like to eat, what you can grow in your area. And this isn't the only things that T1 likes to eat. Right. There's lots <laughs> or more likes to grow. growing, yeah. But we wanted to keep the list a little bit shorter, not put 50 different items yeah. <laughs> on, on the list to go through. Yeah. And I have a list, and my list is basically identical to Timon's. Uh, the only difference is my number two. I don't go through quite as much carrots. Now, Timon is a very proficient carrot grower. Yeah. Uh, he used to work on a carrot farm, and they're doing over a million pounds of carrots a season. So. He goes through a lot of carrots. Uh, I never grew that many carrots, but the things that I like to grow was soybeans and dry beans. Right. So right here we have some black beans in the, in the white pail, and then we have a tub of soybeans in the clear one. And I like to grow a lot of dry beans. I've always liked growing dry beans. So more than half my garden is all dry beans. For protein, I, like, I just like, like beans, and I go through a lot of tofu. A lot of tofu and a lot of soy milk, more than probably most people do. So I need a lot of soybeans in order to keep that up. Some items to think about. Now, these are not necessarily veggies that you're going to grow. Right. Um, salt is one to think about. For uh, Especially, we can't grow salt. Right. But one of the things that we are talking about is when you get the nutrients in your ground up, they're going to have more minerals and in turn have more salt content, which is minerals. And then you won't need as much salt. Right. Now, salt is actually important for body function, yeah. which is why when foods are low in minerals, then we start to have problems because we need those minerals. Uh, oil is another one. Maybe you'll have to grow a bunch of sunflowers, or maybe you'll grow a bunch of soybeans that you'll just use for making oil out of. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to, to do oil, and you can do it by hand. It's not complicated. Um, you can get little hand crank oil, oil presses. And uh, I know, um, if any of you know who Jerry Franklin is, the book You Can Survive, at his camp, he was always demonstrating a press so it had an arm that you would lift up and bring it down, and you would squeeze the, the oil out of the sunflowers. Not necessarily essential. Um, it is important that you have fats. So you're going to want to grow something that has fat in it, uh, because you need that for proper body function. But if you want oil, that could be used for cooking, that can be used for lamps, that can be used for many different purposes. Um, next one is sweetener. So that could be honey, maple syrup, sugar beets, uh, sugar cane, depending on the where area you live, yeah. where you live, again. <laughs> um, I prefer honey because honey is not that hard to do. Maple syrup's great, but it's only in very select areas. Mm -hmm. Where I was in Saskatchewan, we would harvest our own maple syrup because we had maple trees there. Mm -hmm. Here, we don't have that. You can do birch syrup. It takes a lot more work because there's not so many birch trees and it's not quite the same taste. Yeah. It's a little bit more bitter than, than maple syrup. But honeybees is a great thing to have. Natural remedies as well with honey. Mm -hmm. You can use that on burns. I know someone who had a big outdoor boiler and uh, they threw something in the boiler and the fire came out, it exploded, and it burnt their arm almost mm -hmm. all the way up to their forearm and it looked like a burnt hot dog. All the skin started to peel off. It was black. It was horrible. Hmm. And they just put their arm in a bucket of honey, of liquid honey. And they left it there. And every, I think it was every 12 hours or so, the honey would start to get hot because it's pulling all of that heat and all the toxins out of there. Wow. And then they would change it. Now, today, you would never know that they burnt their hand like that. Hmm. It looks just perfectly normal. I had a big burn on my arm, you can't see it today, where I leaned on the rototiller exhaust pipe. Oh. I didn't even feel it. It just melted the skin and it was just dripping off in an area and went right through the nerves. I put honey and now today you can't even tell that I was burned. Mm. So that's a very powerful healer. Um, and if you want some sweetness in your life, then you might want to have some honeybees. That's right. 
Sourdough starter. Maybe you can mention something about that. Yeah. So when you bake bread, you have two main options, I guess, how you can make it. One is to use yeast, and then one is to use sourdough. Now the yeast is something we generally buy in the store, and you can use that. But sourdough is something that's very easy to replenish as long as you do it right. And I'll say that because my wife has been trying to do sourdough for several years now, and she's finally figured out how to do it, and she's very happy, and I'm very happy because I like sourdough bread a lot. So sourdough starter can be really helpful because you can keep it going, and you can... Um, Maybe you can explain what sourdough starter is. Yes. So basically, sourdough starter is you have grains that are milled up to flour, and then you have water in there. And as the flour kind of ferments, it builds that sourdough fermentation, I guess. And I'm not a professional at explaining this, but basically, if you get it right and you keep feeding it with new flour and new water and you take some of the sourdough out and you add some more new flour and you kind of feed it, and as you process it along, it will become that sourdough that even the Bible talks about. And so when you then add some of the starter into a big bowl of flour with water and with salt and whatever else you want to add to your bread, you can then add some sourdough starter and it will actually, within less than a day, develop sourdough in the whole bowl. Like it'll take over, it'll make everything sourdough in there. And then you can bake it and it will rise really nice and have a tiny bit of a sour taste to it, not too bad but it'll really make the bread nice and, and fluffy and soft. And that can really help when you're baking bread. And that's something that you can grow then yourself and right. start yourself. So now let's talk about amounts. Now this is probably going to be one of the most shocking um, charts that we're going to have on the screen here. It may seem like a lot at the start. But if we go down, let's start at potatoes. Now, me and Timon thought long and hard on these amounts and taken yeah. many different charts from many different people and correlated to what we've been used to growing and how much we, we use. Now, this is going to change for everybody. Right. This isn't um, you know, a set thing that everybody's... Maybe you're going to grow more of something else. But we thought this was a really great start especially because we were calculating in the nutrition factor. So you have your carbs, your proteins, your fats, your, your greens, and then your fresh things, all these uh, taken into consideration. So we have the, our first thing, potatoes. So maybe you can mention a, a couple of the items here and why you think yeah, sure. we came up with these. Yeah, so for the potatoes, we, we suggested that... Um, if you use them at least, let's say, three times a week, you use potatoes for some or another meal. And if you have two people and you cook for them and you say, we're going to use about three pounds or so, then that will add up if you add it up for the whole year. We did the math on that. It'll come out to about 500 pounds per year. Now, we suggested that the potatoes are easy enough to grow, that you should grow a little bit more so you have seed for next year. You have seed potatoes for next year. So we suggest that if you add another 150 pounds or so to that, you will have enough to plant and harvest enough again next year if everything goes right. So that adds up to about 650 pounds. So if you're in that range, you have enough to eat all year long, and then you will have enough for planting new potatoes. Now, I would suggest that you kind of sort out a little bit what you want for seed at the beginning of the season so that at the end of the winter you don't end up with all these little small potatoes that might not grow as nice for you. So kind of pick the medium, smaller size for seed, put that aside. And then if you pick too many aside, you can eat some of those in the spring before planting, but kind of set that aside so you don't have no potatoes to plant next year. And maybe I'll just say about the potatoes, it doesn't matter what size of potato you plant. That's right. It doesn't determine the potato size that you're going to get in the garden. Because you're taking, really what you're doing is cloning the potato. Because you're right. taking the direct genetic information 
and you're just splitting it and allowing it to keep growing. So even if you plant a tiny little potato as seed, or even I've planted just the roots, mm -hmm. sometimes the, the, it's called eyes. So on a potato, you have these little divots, mm -hmm. and that's called an eye, and that will make a long root. Right. And sometimes those roots will break off mm -hmm. before you get time to plant. And I've planted a row of potatoes just with the roots, with no potatoes, and we got full harvest of potatoes. Now, if your soil is not nutritious enough, the roots are going to have a little bit more struggle because yeah. at the start, they're taking a lot of nutrients from that potato. So if they don't have enough in the ground, they're not going to have a good head start. Right. Good. Then the other thing that we suggested was carrots there. And for those who were thinking, you know, if you have about four pounds or so per week, for two people, that will be enough to make some salad, to use some for cooking, and to get you through a good part of the winter. So if you can store them well, and you use them starting in the fall when they come on, and you use them all the way through winter, you can add up 200 pounds pretty quick if you use some every week. Um, another thing is here, the cabbage. We, we wrote on there about 100 heads, and the reason for that is because Sometimes cabbage will be very big or very small, and depending on what variety you use, a head might bring you way more than some other small types. So the 100 heads are just a kind of an idea, but if you grow a variety that makes small heads, you may need double that, 200 heads, for example, to still get the same amount. So we just put that kind of there as a number. Um, and if you make sauerkraut and you make a decent bit, almost half of that will go into your sauerkraut right there. So when, when I used to make sauerkraut, we would do it in a 20-gallon crock. It's mm -hmm. called a crock. It's a big, heavy stone pot. And we would fit 40 heads, and these were good size heads. Good size heads of cabbage, 40, shred it up into the crock with salt, and then that's all you do. And it'll store just in the kitchen or or anywhere that you have that, all the way through the year, as long as it's there. If you want, you can take it out, you can put it in jars, you can do whatever, but you can leave it right in the crock, and it'll store for a long time, and it's very, very healthy. It has a lot of good bacteria, helps with your digestion, and it's very simple to do. Right. And then the other part that we were thinking, you could use fresh to make soups, and other things, sometimes people like to make cabbage rolls, or you can just make a cabbage salad, like when you get more into the winter and all your lettuce is gone, you can grind it up really fine and make cabbage salad, and that can be a good thing to still get something fresh in. So that was kind of the idea on that. For the onions, I don't know about you, but it's probably not an overestimation to use one to two onions per day. That's an easy thing. For two people, you'll use one to two onions a day, easy. And then if you add that up for a whole year, that'll, that'll give you quite a few. Now then, if you do canning, and you want to can tomato sauce and use some onion in there, you'll actually use quite a bit in there. You do other canning, say you do some pickles and you want to put a little bit of onion in there, or you... Maybe you want to pull some of your onions early while they're still young, because... Right. You want to be having onion before they're big. That's before going to use quite a few. Up, yeah. So basically, you'll need quite a bit more onions than just one or two a day. And then when you're cooking and you're canning and you're using all these things, that'll add up quick. Now then, if you get sick or someone in your family gets sick and you need some for the natural remedies that I mentioned earlier, like cutting it up on a plate or even making onion juice and putting it in the ears to help the infections, you can use up onion very quickly. Even for one bee sting, you'll use half an onion, but you might put the other on, half on later. So it can add up fast. An onion is not very hard to grow, and it's, it's not very, um, like you don't have a lot of problems with pests and disease. So I would grow at least a thousand bulbs for two people, maybe even more if you can. Because if you use some fresh and you add all the things that we talked about here, it's easy for you to use those up. Now, I don't know if Timon was able to bring everybody sort of past the staff gardens there. Yeah, we did a little bit. Um, 
I planted, there's about 1,300 onions in that spot. Yeah, we spot. didn't get all the way up there yet. So if you went to look where our garden is, that area, so you can visually see what 1,300 planted onions looks like. And there's 1,300 onions yeah, there of different kinds. Yeah, and it's actually not a huge spot. Like, you can plant them fairly close to mm -hmm. each other. And if you have a couple beds, 1,000 onions is nothing. So that's really handy to have. And actually, up until this year, now, Timon has been doing his onions from seed. So he starts them early in the greenhouse, yeah. early enough that when they go outside, they're, they're nice little plants, and then they size up mm -hmm. uh, by fall time. I had always used onion sets, if people know what that is. They're right. little, little bulbs that are pre-done, and I never even had experience doing that. So he said, no, it's way better to do it by seed, which that's the way we're going to have to do it later anyways. Right. And so I said, okay, well, let's, let's do it all by seed. And they're just beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's so nice to do I, your own. I believe I mentioned that on the garden tour on our first day. Um, the main reason why I started planting them from seed is because I did get little onion sets from the store and they had a little bit of mold and rot on them and that brought the seeds into my whole onion bed and I had nice plants and eventually they started rotting from underneath so when the plant died there was no more onion left to be had. So what I did is I planted a whole bed maybe 10-15 meters long nice and wide and then I ended up harvesting like maybe 10 bulbs, the rest was rotten. So I studied into it and I'm like, what can I do to get rid of this? I don't want to be spraying anything. And in some cases there, it may have even been too late by the time I found that they were sick. If you spray them, they would still rot away. And onion does need quite a bit of water to grow in the summer. So that doesn't really help you when you have sickness because the sickness grows faster with that extra water as well. So what I found out is if you grow them from seed, there's a very low chance of bringing in sickness. It's not zero, but it's very low. So then if you grow them from seed, yes, it takes a little bit longer, but then when you transplant them, there's, there's only this healthy plant that you grew in your greenhouse going into the ground. You're not bringing all this mold and rot in. And ever since I grew them from seed, it was, in the worst case, maybe two or three onions in my whole patch that had some kind of you know, sickness or a little bit of rot on them and the rest was healthy. And I thought that was really helpful. So that's my main reason for growing them from seed. The other reason was if you go to the store and you buy onion sets, they'll have two, three, maybe four varieties for you. And you don't really know what they are and there's not a whole lot of description on it. If you buy onion seed, you can choose from, I'm sure it's not an overstatement, 30 varieties that will grow in your area. You can get different colors, different sizes, types, and you have a lot more variation to play with to find the right one for your location. So that's another thing that I found was really helpful by starting them from seed. Um, what else do we have here? Tomatoes. Did we talk about these? No. No. Tomatoes <coughs> is something, I don't know, some people might not like them, but in my family, everyone likes tomatoes. And if they're actually sweet and juicy, they go really fast. I can never grow enough of them. So here we were suggesting that once to twice per week, you'll definitely use tomatoes in one or another way. And we um, checked it out. One of these one liter jars or one quart jars, they are about 2.8 pounds of tomatoes that go in there when you can it. So that's actually quite a bit. And if you use that once to twice a week, maybe even a little more, you, you can add up quite a bit over a year. And so here, 300 pounds, is, it may be enough, but if you like tomatoes and you eat a bunch fresh when you're harvesting them already, that may not even be enough. Now, those are not the most essential for your food, so if you have to only eat them once in the winter per week, that's okay. But I would say 300 pounds is definitely a good start. If you grow that much, you'll, you'll, you'll have a good start. And some of this seems like a lot of tomatoes to yeah. grow, 300 pounds. But when you have healthy plants, if you have a little greenhouse, you can actually get quite a lot. Yeah. This morning, uh, Timon went out to pick uh, tomatoes for the, the, for the kitchen, lunch yeah. today. And it was a little tub yeah. about this size. And there was how much, how many tomatoes? I think it was seven or eight kilos. Eight kilograms Tubby. of potatoes. 
of tomatoes. So 14, times 2.2, 2, yeah. yeah, 17, 17, 18 pounds yeah. of tomatoes just in a little, little container Box, like yeah. that. So it can add up quite quickly. Then we have dry beans. So dry beans, I calculate one pound per day. And that would be for, you could spread that over soy milk, tofu, maybe it's just beans. Maybe you just slow cook beans overnight or whatever. Um, maybe it's hummus in the form of from chickpeas. Mm. Um, many different options for beans. Uh, that's very important for protein, like we mentioned. So a pound a day times 365 days a year. Right. So that's why we have dry beans at 400 pounds. Now that'll give you a little bit of a, a buffer zone for having plenty to seed back in the ground because yeah. you're getting many, many times yeah, one what bean you're will in. bring you a lot of beans if the plant matures well. So you won't need hundreds of pounds to seed. Like a couple pounds will bring you several hundred pounds if you have a good crop. So that's that's a good thing. Just for reference, we have some black beans right here and this bucket was about just over 30 pounds yeah I 33 pounds in the white Around in the white five gallon pail. just over 15 kilos for those who like that I like it so you'll need yeah 12 of these buckets would get you enough for an entire year right and dry beans doesn't mean they all have to be black beans or kidney beans that could include your soybeans some of different types of beans because you want variety and um, it's nice to have different colors in there too when you use them. And then also for making tofu and soy milk, soybeans are obviously the best. So. And I like to grow a lot of soybeans because I go through a lot of tofu and yeah. soy milk. Okay, what else do we have here? Then we have our winter squash. Right. So we're not going to have that for the whole year because it is only going to store for maybe 16 weeks from when you pick it. Right. Um, so that's maybe from, let's say, your last harvesting in October into January. And if you had squash, now when I lived in Saskatchewan, we grew a lot of squash because it grew very well and our plants were very big, much bigger than we get our plants here. Right. I would plant one plant and sometimes it would be eight, 10 feet across and you'd get up to a dozen squash on, on one plant. So you're getting a huge production. Here it's not quite as much. We're still playing with everything because trying we're figure trying out to figure out the right timing and the right uh, balance of everything. Um, so we would eat squash, it was almost every day. <laughs> We'd have potatoes every day, at least once a day, and we would have squash almost once a day at least. <laughs> Uh, because that was the things that grew really easily for us. So here, most people don't eat that much squash or pumpkin, um, but maybe going back to what you like to eat and what grows in your area, you might have to change what you like to eat to what is good to grow in your area. So we said if you ate squash twice a week, then that's how we were calculating. That can be in any form. That could be in soups. That could be just baked. We would just cut the top off the squash, scoop out the seeds, put the lid back on, put it in the oven, and in an hour, then you have a nice squash just ready to, to eat like that. Right. So then we had saying about 50 mature, decent-sized squash, squash fruits, yeah. would, be, would be a good amount to start. Then wheat, Yes. which uh, most people don't think of growing in their garden. But this is actually probably a very important one to actually learn how to grow, especially if you want things like bread. Right. Bread or even pasta, things like this, all use wheat. So we have 400 pounds of wheat, and that is taking in calculation of how much bread you're eating. So we said about five loaves per week is what we thought would make sense. And each of those loaves taking just about one and a half pounds of wheat or flour per loaf, equaling about 390 pounds of, of wheat. Now, if you were able to go or able to go still and go see our garden, you'll see the block of wheat that we have there. It's in the far, um, yeah. it's in the far corner there. 
And right now, we're getting about 100-fold from what we put in. So we plant one seed, we get 100 seeds. So if you plant one pound of wheat, you should get 100 pounds of grain from the one pound that you put in the ground. Now, that's on good conditions, good spacing, good everything else. Um, but you're getting quite a high amount. So it doesn't take a lot of input to get quite a good uh, return from that. Right. Then we have sprout seeds. And that's something really awesome to have in the winter. Um, sprouting seeds is very easy. You don't need a big greenhouse for it. You just need a jar, some clean water that doesn't have any bad additives or chlorines in it, and your sprouts are going to go. And you can do that through the whole year, but especially in the winter, to get fresh things on your table. And believe it or not, you don't need a whole lot to actually get a jar full of sprouted seeds. Like a little spoonful of seeds, once you soak that and once it starts growing, it'll fill your jar right up. So we have some sprouting seeds here in the bag, and that's actually quite a lot. Like this will get you through a long time. So, so we said five plus pounds of sprout seeds. This is five pounds of sprout seeds. So that's what it looks like. And you can see it's not a lot. It doesn't add up to a lot, but this would make you a lot of food. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of, of green, fresh food that has good enzymes, good nutrients for all winter. And you can use so many different kind of things for sprouts that yeah. actually are already growing in your garden. Right. It can be radish. So if you grow an extra spot of radish and then you just let them go to seed. Right. And the seed is extremely easy to harvest. It's super fast. You can see that in the book, Seed to Seed. It's mm -hmm. one of the easiest uh, seeds to grow, probably. Yeah, probably. It actually makes almost like a little tree, a little bush about this size. There's a whole bunch of little pods that are hanging there. Just pick all the pods, crush them up, and then just yeah, blow on there. it, and the chaff will go, and you have all your seeds. Super easy. Uh, broccoli. If you're already growing some broccoli, and you that let that... That will go to seed, too, once the heat comes and you don't water it enough. It'll just go right to seed, so... Use broccoli seed. You can let some kale grow into the next year and I'll, it'll go to seed this tall flower, all nice and yellow. And it'll throw so much seed. If you don't pick it, the, the birds will come, lots will fall on the ground and there'll be kale everywhere. So it's another thing you can grow. And then something that I found really awesome in our area, not specifically only here, but in the central and southern BC, there is a lot of alpha alpha growing and it will grow on the side of the road. It'll grow in all the big fields that are irrigated and even some that are non-irrigated. And the alpha alpha goes to flower like crazy and once it matures, if you go and pick for five minutes, you can have a handful of nice alpha alpha seed. And that can be really good to use for sprouting as well. So this some is of actually those things, alpha alpha seed, by the so, way. Yeah, some of those things you may not even have to grow specifically in your garden. You may be able to go and pick them out on your field, in your orchard, on the hay field. Just pick them up when they're dry and store them cool and dry, and, and you're set for the winter. You can even, uh, some of your peas, people sprout right. peas and then they eat the young plants. Or sunflowers. Small peas. Sunflowers are a great sprout. It makes a big plant. You don't need a lot of it. And then that can be like lettuce in the, in the wintertime. Right. So sprouts are a great one. Uh, if, I'll just give a side note, because I see we have a little bit of time still. Right. On the broccoli. So some of these foods, if you're, let's say you're growing broccoli, and it doesn't make a nice head and it goes straight to seed, you do not want to use that seed to grow your broccoli next year. Because what you're telling the plant is, I don't want you to make a head. I want you to go straight to seed. So if you save that seed next year, it's going to go straight to seed again. You'll never get broccoli ever again. So if that happens, just let it go, but then save the seed just to use for sprouts. Right. Don't use that to actually grow your broccoli. If you're going to want to save seeds of broccoli, pick a head that is lasting longer than any of the others before it goes to seed. Right. And then you're telling it, we want you to last a long time. Don't go to seed. And that might worry you because it's not going to seed. But then you can even take that plant. You could cover it with hay over winter. Or you could dig it out, put it in your root cellar, let it sit there, and then plant again in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then it should go to seed. And that's a good broccoli plant for keeping the seed. That's the same for all the brassicas. Cabbage, 
kale, broccoli, uh, all these things, you want to be producing ones that are not wanting to go to seed right away. It's called bolting. Right. Good. Then we have one more up there for you, which is lettuce. And like I said, it's easy to grow. It's not a heavy feeder. And you can grow it several times throughout the season to always have some available. And depending on how much lettuce you eat, I like to eat a lot of it. If you plan to plant about 20 plants every 10 days, then that will give you enough going through the whole summer. And the reason for that is because some lettuce might take a little bit longer to mature. So you start cutting on the first day, you might cut two or three heads because they're still smaller to make up for the amount that you want. And then as you get toward the end, they're so big that you might not even use the whole head for one meal. So if you can stretch it out and always reseed some new ones, not a whole lot, then that will give you continuous harvest until the frost comes. Um, the last thing that we put up here is fruit. And fruit is very important. It has a lot of good nutrients in it, and it's something that tastes good, that gives a little bit of a change from all the not-so-sweet stuff. And um, a lot of it can grow on bushes or trees that need a lot less um, maintenance or care than some of your plants that you plant by seed into the ground, and you have to weed them, and you have to tie them up, and you have to water them. Trees and bushes are a lot more long-lasting so you plant them once and then yeah you have to prune them a bit and you take care of them but they're kind of working on their own for most part of the year and you don't need new seed for that every year when the apple tree grows it'll grow for 80 years so having fruit can be a real blessing um, there's quite a few we just mentioned here those are not the only ones you can or should grow and also again it depends if you're too far north or in a cold climate even further south you may not be able to grow peaches just because it, the climate is not right for it. But then there's areas even in BC where peaches grow so well that for sure I would grow peaches there, right? Um, so there's also a couple berry bushes. Some are like raspberries, blackberries, blueberries. Um, we have currants on here as well. Strawberries, very nice. Some of those things will grow and Thankfully, God created them so they don't all come on the same week. Some of them will come on earlier, mid of summer. Some will take until the first frost to fully mature. And so you have time to can them, to dry them, to process them. And it can be a real blessing. Now, we put 500 pounds to kind of give you an overview for all of these. But because they're specific to their needs, where they can grow, where they will grow better than other places... It's, it's maybe not the best idea to say you need 20 pounds of this and 15 pounds of that and 100 pounds of this. So we kind of made a total for the fruit. And depending on what is available to you, if you can kind of add those up to that amount, that'll be a pretty good start. And then depending on your area. So here, for example, peaches are not going to grow. Apricots yeah. are not going to grow. Right. Um, bananas are not going to grow. Uh, except inside the house. <laughs> except inside the house, which I'm trying. Um, but things like apples, you can plant a tree, and if you plant it the way that we were talking about the other day, it can start and it can produce a lot faster and a lot more. Um, if you don't have a lot of some of these fruits or berries uh, and you're trying to get something quick, uh, strawberries are a great thing because yeah. you can start them from seed or you can start them, get the plants, and they send a lot of runners out. And then you take those little baby plants and you put them in a row and now you have a lot of strawberries. Another thing that's really interesting is garden huckleberry. Mm -hmm. And that's a very fascinating plant we grew this year. And it makes a little blackberry and it makes a lot. At the start of the year, I was worried that we were maybe going to get five berries. But now the plant has gotten to be quite a good size. And a lot of people say you can get a gallon of, of berries off one of these plants. And you just, we started from seed this spring in the greenhouse, then we put it outside. And a lot of people use them for making jams, jellies, um, pies, fruit preserves, all these kind of things. So just play with different things in your area. And uh, this may seem like a lot of food. We have big numbers here. It'll yeah. come across like it's a lot. But if you look up the average person 
in North America eats around 2,000 pounds of food a year. Right. This added up total, this is for a couple, is 3,000 pounds. So it's actually less than the average person eats Would in eat, one yeah. year. So it's not as much as it looks like, but that's how much per a person actually goes through in a year. Hmm. So maybe we'll stop here and we can take a few questions before we, before we end. Yeah, let's do that. First one. This one is about your last talk you had. Okay. Store-bought veggies and fruits might be more nutritious. Is that true? Uh, I saw you had a graph for spinach um, and it was second to tomatoes and iron. It made me think that you used organic. Okay, maybe that was a little bit misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So the graph was showing the first year they tested, and this was commercially grown produce, was very high. And then the next 20 years, it was extremely low compared to the previous 20 years. So we are actually showing quite the opposite, yeah. that this food from the grocery store is very low compared to what your personal garden is, because you're actually putting care into what you're growing, not them, which is just pumping some chemicals to make some some right. nice plants. Mm -hmm. Even I think the organic sector doesn't use real compost and stuff like that mainstream. It's pretty rare. Yeah. There are some, if you go to small farmers that have time and the heart to do it right and to put their heart into it, they will have good produce. But on big scale, it's, it's quite difficult to, to do thousands of acres like you would do your own garden, right? So. Yeah. Do you need to rest the land that you plant in every seven years or so, at all? That's a good question. Uh, that was actually one of the ordinances in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, they had seven Sabbaths that they were supposed to keep. And one of those Sabbaths was the seven-year land Sabbath. Now, it is not a bad practice to rest your ground. Um, but it's not good to just leave it bare and dry with nothing on it. So that is not the point. What they did in the Old Testament is everything that was self-seeded from the previous year, they would let grow. So it actually wasn't bare. There was things growing. Mm -hmm. And then that was so that the people who didn't have as much money could go onto that land and actually harvest everything and eat it. So it wasn't that they didn't do anything and not a plant was allowed to grow. It was for a different purpose. So it's not a bad practice to be trying to help our ground if we wanted to rotate things through. Um, would you recommend rotating your um, growing for the year? Um, instead of growing everything you need for one year, would you recommend growing some of it for two years and then rotating so that you don't grow everything each year? Like your supply that you oh. need for the whole year? That's a good question. Yeah. I think with regard to your dry beans, that could be could more be possible. It, yeah. You could grow quite a few in a year, but most of this stuff is perishable. So right. it's not going to last for two years. Your potatoes, yeah. most of the things we have here, unless it's canned, is not going to be able to be um, stored for, for right. that long of and a time. And even canned stuff doesn't get better in the jar. So if you can do it fresh every year, it's going to be a lot better in the winter. So unless it's dry goods like beans or some of the grains, if you can store them really well without going bad, it could be worth it to grow them every other year and store them. But um, Now it's good to grow a little bit extra because if your crop the next year is, is not quite as good, then true. you have some extra. Yeah. But I think there's a reason that Ellen White said that we should be raising our gardens because if we could just store a bunch of buckets of dry beans, Might as well. then... That's, that's not the purpose, though. Yeah. So there's many more things that are going along with that for character development and for actual nutritional needs for growing every year. Right. Is the wheat sprayed, if you grow wheat, um, is that bad for you? Like, is the glyphosates or whatever that are in the traditional wheat going to be in the wheat you grow? How does that work? If you're growing wheat... Usually, I would buy organic wheat to, to plant or someone that I know isn't spraying it because I don't want that chemical to hurt my soil. 
but it's not going to be going in your new plant that's growing necessarily. Uh, what would you recommend if you're gluten-free and you want something like that to grow? Have you ever had any experience growing any different types of grain? I mean, there's quite a few things that are gluten-free that people eat when they're gluten-free. So some of those can be grown. Um, I have met a few people, and I'm just telling that from my experience, that have had intolerances for different foods. And then when they tried foods that came from our garden or from our field, they weren't intolerant to it. So they were actually not allergic to it. So there is times where people are actually allergic to the chemicals or sprays or other amendments that have been added to the crop from the store. And that's what actually makes them sick. Now, I'm not saying that gluten-free doesn't exist. That exists and people have that in cases where whatever they eat gluten will not be helpful to them. So sometimes it might be worth a try. If you grow it yourself, you may be able to eat it. And if not, then grow the things that you would normally use and, and try to grow those. So like oats. Right. Oats is a good example. Or things like millet, maybe corn. And yeah. you could do cornmeal, uh, things like that. Um, so there's definitely options. And maybe I'll just mention, with the grain, and with the sensitivity to like the glyphosites and things like that. I used to live in Saskatchewan again. And uh, it is pretty scary, actually, the way that they're growing the food. So the, when the seed's put in the ground, it's sprayed. And then it's sprayed to grow. And then it's sprayed to ripen. And then it's sprayed to kill it. Yeah. And sprayed to dry it. So you're having so many applications of these harmful chemicals. And when they... Uh, high clearance spray these crops, you can't go in the field for two weeks. Two weeks, if anything passes through that field, it'll drop dead before it gets to the other side. So a deer, as it's walking by, it'll drop dead in the field. Coyote, anything, if it's walking through, it'll drop dead. Hmm. My brother, he's still working out there. He was working on a tractor, changing one of the big tires, and they high clearance sprayed with an airplane over the top and some, and they didn't go right over the top, but some of that drift came, came and got right to him and the other guy that was working, they almost didn't make it out of there. They had to crawl to the trucks. They couldn't breathe and they couldn't move. Started to shut down their entire bodies. So this is pretty dangerous stuff, which shows why people would be intolerant to eating it. Right. So nuts are usually a big part of a vegan diet. What do you do if you don't have a nice, good, old nut tree on your property? Is it a big problem? Can you grow something else for nuts? I think if you can, plant the tree today. Get those nuts growing because the tree will supply you with nuts for free as long as it grows there, and that can be a long time. In the meantime, there's probably different options. Nuts store fairly well, so you could get some and have a little bit of uh, store up of that until your tree starts producing. And also, something that we shouldn't forget, mo most times we have neighbors. Maybe someone has a nut tree and they don't even use them because they don't like to eat them. Maybe you can get started, trade something with them, talk with them. But I would plant trees if I can and just get that going. A uh, so couple options are some of the seeds. Right. in place of nuts. So sunflowers, you can grow sunflowers and, and use that. You can do peanuts, which you can do every year. You just plant them in the ground, they grow like potatoes, pull up the plant, and then you have peanuts there. So there's definitely options. Which refractometer did you buy? You mentioned you bought a refractometer on Amazon. Which kind was it? And uh, just to say I answered the other question, the device that measures um, bricks. Your bricks is a refractometer. So there's no specific brand you need to worry about. If you go on uh, Amazon or any other place, uh, even garden stores sometimes have them, right. as long as it says that it's for vegetable testing, because there's acid ones, there's different kinds of the refractometers, it has to be for bricks, it has to be for the sugar. And the best one for most people is going to be from 0 to 32 bricks level. Then your chart inside is going to be easier to read. Because 0 to 90, the fractions become very small, and it's, it's a little bit hard to read. So 0 to 30, 
um, is a good range, and just make sure it says that it's bricks and it's for vegetables, and that's all you need to know. And uh, Timon mentioned uh, to store bigger potatoes, and then you said if you store smaller ones, it's still okay. But I think the reason why you said not to store the little ones is because they can dry out. Is that right? Yeah, it's just um, if you use big potatoes for your seed, you're using one potato, which is a lot of food that you could eat. So if you use some more on the smaller side, that same amount of weight will make you four or five plants. Now, if you have really, really small potatoes, they will still grow, but oftentimes they're so little, and if they dry out or if they get a little bit damaged, half the potato is already gone. So I've found that if they're a medium size, maybe just smaller than an egg or around that size, those will start out the best even when the conditions are not ideal in spring. But what Mackenzie said is true. You can grow them from the smallest potato. You can grow them even from some of the shoots that break off potentially when the conditions are right. But if you take smaller ones, then it's going to be more plants out of the same amount of potato in, in mass, right? And so the that small was the ones will rot faster when storing. Right. So a lot of times uh, it's good like practice mini ones, to yeah. separate the tiny little ones from the big ones instead of having them all mixed up because if one of those little guys goes bad, it'll start making the big ones go yeah. bad. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's been extremely informative and everyone has enjoyed it. So thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. And maybe you can have a, a word of prayer to end. Sure. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this day once again. Thank you that you brought us here and that we could talk about growing food. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us so many different things that we can grow and eat. And thank you, Lord, that you also help us to learn how to grow that and that you promise that you'll bless our efforts and that even though it's going to be hard work and we're going to be sweating when we do it, you'll still bless us with enough and way more than we need. Please continue to guide us as we prepare for the Sabbath here today. And thank you that you will be with each one of us and everyone who is watching online as well and who will be watching this in the future. And help us, Lord, to most importantly trust in you in everything we do. And thank you for everything you have done for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This presentation was filmed at our 2022 camp meeting on site in British Columbia. If you would like to join for the next camp meeting, visit our events page for details, events.amazingdiscoveries.org.